Sayın Başkanım, kıymetli misafirler ve sevgili öğrenciler. Sakarya Üniversitesi Orta Doğu Araştırmaları Merkezi ve Siyaset, Ekonomi ve Toplum Araştırmaları Vakfı tarafından düzenlenen 2. Orta Doğu'da Siyaset ve Toplum Kongresi'ne hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Açılış konuşmasını yapmak üzere Orta Doğu Araştırmaları Merkezi Müdürü Profesör Doktor Sayın Kemal İnat'ı konuşmalarını yapmak üzere kürsüye davet ediyorum. Sayın Başkanım, değerli misafirler, sevgili öğrenciler, önce kongremize hoş geldiniz diye başlamak istiyorum. Şimdi Ortodok Kongresi neden yapıldı sorusu üzerine kısa bir açıklamayla başlamak istiyorum. Çok kısa konuşacağım. Asıl konuşmacılarımı daha sözü bırakmak için daha sonra. Sonuçta Ortodok'u hepimiz takip ediyoruz. Ortodok'u Maalesef ciddi sorunlarla yaşandı. Sürekli sorunlarla anılan bir bölge. Bu sorunların önemli bir kısmı, büyük bir çoğunluğu Orta Doğu'nun iyi tanımaması, bölge dışındaki bölge dışındaki ülkelerin ve halkların belki Orta Doğu'yu bizden daha iyi tanıması ve bilmesi maalesef çoğu zaman da yapıcı olmayan, yıkıcı politikaları Nedeniyle bu sorunlar yaşandığını söyleyebiliriz. Ee, bölge ülkeleri olarak, bölge halkları olarak biz Orta Doğu'yu çok iyi tanımıyoruz. O yüzden bu tür kongreleri biz kendi içinde yaşadığımız bölgeyi, halklarıyla birlikte, sorunlarıyla birlikte tanımak için, bu sorunları iyi analiz edebilmek için, bu sorunlara çözüm bulabilmek için e, bu tür aktiviteleri düzenliyoruz. E, bu bizim ikinci e, kongremiz olacak. İki sene önce e, bu Ortadoğu'da Siyaset ve Toplum Kongresi'nin birincisini gerçekleştirmiştik. Ee, bu kongreyi Sakarya Üniversitesi bünyesinde kurulmuş olan Ortadoğu Araştırmalar Merkezi SETA Vakfı ile birlikte e, düzenliyor. Tabii ki çok, çok sayıda destekçimiz de var. Başbakanlık Tanıtım Fonu'ndan Dışişleri Bakanlığı'na kadar, SAM'a kadar e, Bizim bu aktivitemize destek veren, finansal destek veren kuruluşlar söz konusu. Ee, biraz orta, bu kongreyi düzenleyen Orta Doğu Araştırmalar Merkezi'nden kısaca bahsetmek istiyorum. Ee, orta Doğu Araştırmalar Merkezi yaklaşık bir yıl önce kuruldu. Ee, neden bahsediyorum aslında onu söyleyeyim. Ee, Türkiye'de gerçekten bu tür merkezlere çok ciddi ihtiyaç e, söz konusu. Biz yaklaşık bir sene önce kurulduk. Şu anda yaklaşık e, 30 kadar araştırmacısı olan, çalışan, çalışanı olan bir merkez ortadoğu araştırma merkezi. Şu anda 14 asistanımız var. Sadece ortadoğunun değişik alanları ile ilgili çalışan, mesela sadece İran konusunda uzmanlaşmaya çalışan 3 e, e, asistanımız söz konusu. Sadece Irak çalışan 2 asistanımız söz konusu. E, Suriye, Mısır, Suriye Arabistan ve Diğer orta komitelerin çalışan, bunları dilleriyle birlikte, e, dillerini de öğrenerek çalışmaya e, gayret eden asistanlarımız söz konusu. Asistanlarımızın dışında, e, yine orta doğuda çalışan yaklaşık 10 öğretim üyesi, orta doğu araştırma, araştırmaları merkezinde çalışmaya devam ediyoruz. Merkez bünyesinde iki e, lisans üstü programımız var, bir doktora programımız var. 3 dildi, Türkçe, İngilizce ve Arapça. Bir yüksek lisans programımız var. O da 4 dildi olan. Bu çerçevede Orta Doğu Araştırmaları Merkezi'nde az önce söylediğim o Orta Doğu Bölgesi'ni daha iyi tanıma ve sorunlarını bilme, anlama, anlatma ve belki çözüm bulma konusunda faaliyetlerimiz devam ediyor. 
Kongreden kısaca bahsedersek, Kongrede yaklaşık 120 katılımcının katılımcının söz konusu. Bu 120 katılımcıdan e, yaklaşık 110 civarında tebliğ e, söz konusu olacak, tebliğ sunulacak. E, bu tebliğler e, Orta Doğu'nun değişik sorunlarına ilişkin, toplumsal yapısına ilişkin, siyasal yapısına ilişkin konuları içerecek. Kongremiz 4 gün sürecek. E, i̇lk 3 günü, bugün açılış e, günü. Yani ve ondan sonraki gün Sakarya Üniversitesi'nde olacak, Kongre Merkezi'nde yapılacak. Yani ve ondan sonraki günkü oturumda 3 e, ayrı oturum şeklinde gerçekleştirecek. Kapanış oturumumuz ise e, İstanbul'da e, Kongre birlikte düzenlediğimiz SETA Vakfı'nda gerçekleştirilecek. Şimdi bu genel bilgilerin e, yanında şöyle kısaca bir önceki kongreyle değerlendirme ve bir karşılaştırma yapmak istiyorum. Şimdi iki sene önce diğer kongreyi gerçekleştirirken ben aslında bir hayalimden, bir arzumdan bahsetmiştim. Orta Doğu'nun belki bir gün Avrupa gibi, Avrupa'da sağlanan birlik gibi, geçmişimizden çok daha çatışmış olan Avrupa'da sağlanan birlik gibi bir birliğe, bir barış havzasında dönüşmesinin e, mümkün olup olmayacağını sorup hepimizin aslında onun mümkün olması için çalışmamız gerektiğini, gerektiği arzumu dile getirmiştim. Ancak maalesef iki sene sonra yaptığımız bir kongrede bakıyoruz ki aslında Orta Doğu iki sene önce göre çok daha kötü durumda şu anda. Bu bize neyi gösteriyor? Bu bize aslında bu hayal için daha fazla çalışmamız gerektiğini gösteriyor. Orta Doğu'nun çatışma ve savaş içerisinde sorun içerisinde olmasını isteyenler kadar en azından çalışmalıyız. Onlardan daha fazla çalışmalıyız ki Orta Doğu'da gerçekten o arzuladığımız barış ortamının e, kurulması mümkün olsun. Ben bu dileklerle e, konuşmamı sonlandırmak istiyorum. E, katılan herkese teşekkür ediyorum. E, uzak yerlerden gelen konuşmacılarımıza teşekkür ediyorum. Onların katılım olması bu tür aktiviteleri gerçekleştirmek mümkün oldu. Dinleyici olarak gelmiş olan e, bütün e, katılımcılarımıza teşekkür ediyorum ve kongrenin başarılı geçmesini diliyorum. Teşekkürler. Kemal Hocamıza çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi e, açılış konuşmalarını yaptığımız üzere Sakarya Üniversitesi Rektörü Sayın Profesör Doktor Muzaffer Elmas'ı kürsüye davet ediyorum. Değerli misafirler, hepiniz e, yapılmakta olan kongreye hoş geldiniz. Hepinizi saygı, sevgiyle selamlıyorum. E, bu kongreyi e, tertipleyen Orta Doğu Araştırma Merkezi'ne e, gerçekten teşekkür ederim. Tabii bu konuda Kemal Bey kendisinin tevazu olarak burada belirtti ama bu tür işler üniversitelerde onlarca merkez kuruyor. Belki Türkiye'de çok sayıda binlerce vardır sayısı. Bunlar iş yapıldığı zaman e, bir kurum dilim haline geliyor. Yapılmadığı zaman sadece ismiyle kalıyor. Bu gerçekten iş yapılan ve bir e, üreten e, Türkiye'nin geleceğinde de önemli bir rol olacak bir merkez olarak ben de çalışmalarına devam ediyor. Aslında bu Sakarya Üniversitesi'nin misyonuna çok uygun bir çalışma. E, biz de bu tür çalışmaları çok yakından destekliyoruz. Bildiğiniz gibi Sakarya Üniversitesi'nin iki tane misyon, misyonunda iki tane önemli zinde var. Birisi dünyaya açık bireyler yetiştirmek, yani dünya çapında eğitim, eğitim, araştırma yapmak. Bu konuda önemli mesafeler almış bir üniversite. İkisi, i̇kincisi de Sakarya Üniversitesi misyonunda değerlerine bağlı geçmişini iyi anlayıp geleceğe buna uygun nesiller yetiştirmek misyonunun önemli bir parçası. Bu bağlamda da çok sayıda çalışmalar, örnek çalışmalar yapan bir üniversiteyiz Sakarya Üniversitesi olarak. Tabii bu kalıcı olanları bunların, bu tür e, merkezler tarafından yürütülen çalışmalar, Orta Doğu araştırmaları, e, tabii Orta Doğu çok önemli bir konu, e, bu konuda yapılan çalışmalar. Bunun yanında e, İslami finans e, alanında yeni bir çalışma başlattık. Bunu da e, bu ölçüde destekleyip yakın gelecekte bu konuda önemli bir e, merkez haline geleceğini e, umuyorum, bekliyorum. Bu konuda e, çünkü bu konuda 
بچه باشن دینامیک گنج میکرد و بیتار آیا شکل مسکو هم برشت دونه مرکزه در این که دنیا هست بانک آمده اتیز بیسمش جورت بیموزه بی دوزنگی یه برنجه که حالنه چون خیلی آرلایب برنجه ışık tutacak, bu tür merkezleri üniversite olarak destekliyoruz. Özellikle sosyal alanlarda ki sahip olduğumuz genç ve dinamik kadroyla bunlarda başaracağımızı da inanıyoruz. Bu konuda hiçbir tereddüdüm de yok. Ee, tabii Orta Doğu gerçekten 100 yıl, 110 yıl, işte 1900 yıl yani itibaren e, Batılı devletler tarafından dizayn edilmiş bir yer. İşte bakıyoruz 5-10 sene aldıklarında Libya, Mısır, Cezayir, Bas, e, Yemen, işte Filistin, e, sonra temelleri o zamanlar atılmış ama kuruluşu 1947-1948'lere gelen İsrail. Bu coğrafya şu anda yeniden kimliği bir benliğini bulma aşamasında. Tabi o zaman rol oynayanlar yine rol oynamak istiyorlar ama Türkiye'nin gerçekten e, az önce e, Kemal Bey'in de ifade ettiği gibi önemli bir gelecekte bu ülkelerde e, önemli bir birliktelik sağlamak için buraları iyi analiz etmek lazım. En önemli şey burayı iyi analiz etmek olduğuna inanıyorum. Çünkü gerek siyasetin gerek Türkiye'nin devlet olarak ulusal uluslararası alanda alacağı kararlara bunlar yön verecektir. O bakımdan bu çalışmaların e, biz SETA ve diğer kuruluşlarla da ortak yaşam çalışmaları yürütüyoruz. Türkiye genelinde de ışık tutacağına inanıyorum. Ben kongreyi düzenleyenleri tebrik ediyorum. Sizlere de tekrar hayırlı, başarılı bir kongre süresi diliyorum. Saygılar dilerim. Evet, teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi bir açılış konuşmalarını yapmak üzere AK Parti Dış İlişkilerden Sorumlu Genel Başkan Yardımcısı Profesör Doktor Yasin Akdayı kürsüye davet ediyorum. <gülüyor> Merkezi ben bir süre önce, daha önceden tabii ki izliyordum ama bir süre önce biraz daha mutlali oldum çalışmalarına, ziyaret ettim. Çalışanlarla, çalışanların çalışmalarıyla epeyce tanışma fırsatım oldu ve gerçekten de ben başta Sayın Rektörümüzü bundan dolayı tebrik etme ihtiyacı hissettim. O zaman da tebriklerimi iletmiştim ama Kemal Hoca'ya da Bilhassa böyle bir merkezi, Orta Doğu Araştırmaları Merkezi'ni Sakarya Üniversitesi'ne kazandırmış oldukları için gerçekten bütün kalbi duygularımla tebrik ediyorum. Çok önemli bir şey bu. Yani e, bu tür merkezlerin üniversitelerimizde olması, şimdi bir taşrada üniversiteler, bilmem işte yani de İstanbul'un dışındaki üniversiteler, Ankara, İstanbul'un dışındaki üniversitelere e, birileri biraz farklı bakıyor olduklarını biliyoruz. Fakat e, bu konudaki gelişmenin çok çok farklı, yani bu tür kaygıların ve beklentilerin çok daha ötesinde giderek çok daha iyileşiyor olduğunu, çok daha iyi istikamette seyrediyor olduğunu, bu tür faaliyetleri gördüğümüzde çok daha iyi hissediyoruz. Çok daha iyi görüyoruz. Çok ilginç bir şey. Geçen iki hafta önce Siirt Üniversitesi'nde Uluslararası Eşari Sempozyumu diye bir sempozyuma katıldım. Yani tek kelimeyle büyülendim açıkçası. Yani aslında oluyor. Olduğunu göstermek lazım. Tam da Orta Doğu Sempozyumu, Orta Doğu'da Siyaset ve Toplum Kongresi. Başlık, bence çok manidar bir başlık. Aslında ben konuşmam, biraz sonra benim de ayrı bir konuşmam olacak. Orada belki bunlar biraz daha fazla anlatmam e, gerekecek. Ama siyaset ve Orta Doğu kavramını bir arada tuttuğumuz zaman, bir şey bir arada düşündüğümüz zaman ilk önce paradoksal bir durumla karşı karşıya kaldığımızı ifade etmek gerekiyor. O da şu, Orta Doğu zaten 
kurgulanışı itibariyle 100 yıl önce, bu, bu yıl 100. yıl dönemindeyiz biliyorsunuz. Birinci Dünya Savaşı'nın başlangıcının 100. yıl dönemindeyiz. 100 yıl önce Orta Doğu'ya yapılan müdahale, aslında birinci, birinci Dünya Savaşı'nın en önemli sonucu Orta Doğu diye bir alanın yaratılmış olmasıdır. Yani Osmanlı'nın bakiyesi olarak paramparça bir coğrafya ama her bir parçası da siyasetsizleştirilmiş bir alan. Yani başına dikilen sömürge yönetimleriyle birlikte oraya dikilen insanlar o toplum o toplumun tamamen siyasetsizleştirilmesi üzerine kurulmuş bir alandır Orta Doğu. Yani özeti neyse, özetini soracak olursanız, yani Orta Doğu'nun özeti nedir diye soracak olursanız, Orta Doğu siyasetsiz toplum demektir. Yüz yıl önce kurgulanışı itibariyle siyasetsiz toplum demektir. Ve <gülüyor> bu siyasetsiz toplumda insanlar hiçbir zaman kendi başlarına karar veremeyecek, kendi karar, kaderlerine kendileri hükmedemeyecek, kendileriyle ilgili kararlara hiçbir zaman belirleyici olamayacaklar demektir. Aslında başlarına dikilen diktatörler, başlarına dikilen yöneticiler tam da bu toplumdan hiçbir zaman ayağa kalkamasın, kendi adlarına karar veremesinler, kendi geleceklerinin ve kendi toplumlarının ne olacağına karar veremesinler. Tek fonksiyonları bu, en önemli fonksiyonları bu olmuştur bu, yönet- bu yönetimlerin. Ve bu fonksiyonu da çok başarıyla yürütmüşlerdir. Onun için bu toplumlar alabildiğine siyasetsizleştirilmiştir. Ne kadar siyasetsizleştirilirsin, siyasetsizleştirilsin tabii bir yerde insan varsa siyaset iradesi de hep var olacaktır. Ama bu siyaset iradesi hep bastırılmıştır. Ne zaman siyaset yapmaya kalkışsa, kendi kararını vermeye kalkışsa, kendi kaderini değiştirmeye kalkışsa, onun üzerine mutlaka çok farklı ya entrikalarla, ya doğrudan baskılarla, askeri darbelerle, askeri yönetimlerle, askeri tedbirlerle o toplumların ayağa kalkması, o toplumların bağımsızlaşması, o, o toplumların kendi başlarına karar verebilmesi engellenmeye çalışılmıştır. Dolayısıyla e, siyaset ve Orta Doğu denklemini beraber düşünmek, bu denklem içerisinde düşünmek çok manidar bir şeydir. E, bu kongre dolayısıyla herhalde 120 e, tebliğ sunulacak. Ben hepsinin teker teker başlıklarına baktım, büyülendim. Yani keşke fırsatım olsa, imkanım olsa hepsini e, izleyebilsem. Çünkü canlı olarak izlemek, sonradan tebliğlerden okumaktan bambaşka bir şey. Yani canlı olarak birilerinin sunumunu, takdimini izlemek herhalde bambaşka bir şey. Bu üniversite ortamının da e, güzel tarafı bu. Canlı olarak izliyorsunuz o tartışmayı. E, ne yazık ki izleyemeyeceğim ama bir kısmını izleyebildiğim kadarıyla kadarını izlemeye çalışacağım. Her bir konu tam da Orta Doğu'nun bugün yaşamakta olduğu kaderi çok güzel özetleyen, çok güzel e, dinleyeceğimiz, üzerine çok iyi düşüneceğimiz şeyler. Evet, kongre siyasetin en güzel şekillerinden bir tanesidir. Orta Doğu üzerine düşünmek, Orta Doğu'nun geleceği üzerine düşünmek, mahiyeti üzerine düşünmek, Orta Doğu'nun başına neler gelmiş olduğunu düşünmek ve buradan bir çıkış yolu olup olmadığını düşünmek tam da siyasetin, siyaset iradesinin en iyi beslenebileceği, en iyi motivasyonunu alacağı yerdir. Onun için tabii ki Orta Doğu siyasetsizleştirilmiştir ama e, bu siyasetsizleştirmeyi aşmanın her zaman bir yolu vardır. Heidegger'in Dediği gibi nerede bir ezici iktidar varsa orada kurtarıcı bir güç de ortaya çıkar illaki. Siyaset insana özgü bir şeydir. İnsanın olduğu yerde hiçbir zaman tamamen yok edilemeyen bir şeydir. En azından iradesi yok edilemeyen bir şeydir. Siyasa, siyasalın alanı çok çok daraltılabilir çünkü veya bu faktörlerde ki Orta Doğu'da yaşamış olduğumuz şey budur. Ee, ve en son... Biliyorsunuz Arap Baharı süreci yaşadık. Aslında Arap Baharı süreci tam da kitlelerin, insanların siyasete geri dönüş hamlesidir. Siya- kitleleri kendi kaderlerine hükmetme konusunda, kendi kaderlerini tayin etme konusunda şimdiye kadar e, bloke edilmiş olan iradelerini açma gayretidir. Gayreti idi ki halen o irade ve o gayret devam etmektedir. Tamamen hiçbir zaman söndürülemeyecektir ila nihayet söndürülemeyecek ve eninde sonunda Orta Doğu kendi mecrasını, kendi siyaset mecrasını bulacaktır. Ben tabii açılış konuşması düzeyinde çok daha fazla uzatmayayım. 
Ama Orta Doğu üzerine düşünmek aslında buranın insanını Orta Doğu diye tesniye edilen, adlandırılan bölgenin insanını özgürleştirmenin başlangıcıdır. Özgürleşmenin başlangıcıdır. Ya öz, umarız, umut ediyoruz biz en azından Türkiye'de olarak bu özgürleşme yolunda bir hayli mesafe kat ettik. Biz siyaseti bildik, siyasete sarıldık, siyasetin özgürleştirici tarafını keşfettik ve bu yolda bir hayli mesafe kat ettik. Umarız Orta Doğu da e, bu mecrada kendini özgürleştirmek adına, kendi onurunu kurtarmak adına biliyorsunuz Arap Baharı'nın en önemli sloganlarından bir tanesi keramet idi. Keramet, onur demek. Onur, ö- özgürlük ve ekmek idi. Ekmek, onur ve özgürlük. Bunların sıralamalarını farklı şekillerde değiştirebilirsiniz. Ama onur hiçbirinde önemsiz değil, hepsinde merkezi bir yer tutuyor. Kendi haysiyetini, şerefini kazanmaya çalışmak. Çünkü siyaset imkanı elinden alınmış insanın onuru da zedelenmiştir. Onuru da, haysiyeti de büyük ölçüde elinden alınmıştır. Onun için siyaset aynı zamanda bir haysiyet mücadelesidir. Bir ayakta kalma, bir var olma mücadelesidir. Bu anlamda e, bu Kongre'yi, Kongre'nin başını bu şekilde koydukları için Kongre taktik heyetini can gününden tebrik ediyorum. Bu toplantının hayırlara vesile olmasını diliyorum. Hepinize hürmetle ve muhabbetle selamlıyorum. Açılış konuşması için Lis Üniversitesi'nden Bobi Salman Said'i hep gerileyen halklar istikrarlı bir post Osmanlı bölgesel düzen arayışı başlıklı konuşmasını yapmak üzere kürsüye davet ediyorum. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me and to arranging this um, conference. Um, it's very important that we have conferences like this, which allow us to bring together a number of uh, transformations which are occurring in the field and to allow us to reflect upon things. Um, it's very easy to become consumed by the urgency of tasks that we face. Uh, there's always a kind of the idea that we should be doing something. And sometimes the demand for doing something exceeds any other possibilities. Um, and it's important that to know what we're doing requires us sometimes to step back to reflect on what we're trying to achieve here. Um, the title of this talk is Ever Decreasing Circles, and this is a kind of a description of circles which spiral inwards, becoming smaller and smaller in time. And the reason why I chose this title is if you think what is happening now, uh, supposing you had gone to sleep 
1991 and you woke up now and you were told that the Americans are bombing Iraq again. Um, it would seem like all this time has passed and things are still the same in many, many different ways. Um, and I think uh, Yasin alluded to the 100th anniversary of the First World War and pointed to the way in which we are still dealing with the shadow of that war. So the talk is called A Quest for Post-Ottoman Order. Now, when I did this, the most response was, well, you're going to talk about what happened after the uh, fall of the Ottoman state. And therefore, it should be 1914 to 1917. But I want to suggest to you that there's another way of thinking about the post-Ottoman. Not simply as a description of a period, but something more conceptual. And this is what I'm going to try and show by the end of my lecture, hopefully. Now, there are a number of points that I want to make. But I want to start off with a very kind of basic idea that the question of stability, the question of order, is always expressed within international relations in terms of stability, security, prosperity. And here we have the language of rogue states, we have the idea of terrorism, radicalization, all of these issues are presented as problems that require analysis, that require study. Many of us here are studying them. Many of us are trying to come to terms with some of these geopolitical problems. <laughs> now, it seems to me that one of the two main geopolitical problems right now is the one to do with what kind of order is it possible to have in a region which seems to be characterized as a lack of order? If you look at these two covers, one is a Time magazine in 1979, and the other is a book in 2006 by the Brookings Institute. I'm not trying to imply, by the way, there's any plagiarism or anything here. But simply that from 1979 to 2006, not only is there a notion of crisis, but nothing has really seems to have fundamentally changed. Well, this is the important that the Middle East region is a region of always in crisis, a perpetual crisis. And I want to suggest to you why would that be the case? And how can we try and understand that? The clearest manifestation right now of this crisis is being around the issue of ISIL, Ganesh, ISIS, the Islamic State, but also the Caliphate, as we should uh, have been told that it is. And I think it's interesting to reflect upon what this phenomenon actually shows. And I'd like to make three points, and I'll pick up them up later. Firstly, the declaration of the caliphate, I think, is extraordinary. It's extraordinary because almost 90 years after the caliphate was abolished or transferred to the Grand National Assembly, it's quite remarkable that it exists again or has salience as an ideological or political entity or claim. Why would people, 90 years after the end of the particular institution, try and think they could do some work by proclaiming the caliphate? Now, clearly, to claim the caliphate by ISIL is to reflect some kind of political logic. It's not simply random. And we know there have been many groups over the years who have talked about the caliphate. And we know that, for example, many Western politicians have been talking about the caliphate for the last 10 or 15 years. This has been one of their nightmares. They've been haunted by the caliphate. So in a way, way al-Baghdadi is a confirmation 
of a nightmare that has been foretold through various Western neoconservative discourse, which saw in every attempt for um, Islamist groups or parties to come to power the shadow of the caliphate. And now they have actually got the caliphate that we are uh, thinking about. So obviously, in one way, the caliphate, the declaration of the caliphate, is of trivial importance. It reflects an internal political struggle with Al Qaeda, who said that we had Emirates, and then we will eventually have the caliphate. And of course, ISIL said, well, we've actually re arrived at that stage. So, so that's one element of it, the kind of ideological argumentation. The other element is that ISIL control a borderland between Syria and Iraq. So in a way, they have de facto broken six Picot division of the Middle East, nor can they call this borderland any, doesn't have a regional specific identity. So in a sense, the caliphate reflects that kind of transactional element of their claim. The other element which is interesting is that ISIL emerge in a vacuum created by two failed states. And I would say to you, the proper comparative dimension would us to see them as a phenomenon of warlordism. Warlordism is the privatization of violence and authority in areas where state or public authority cannot maintain itself. And you have it occurring in Africa, in parts of Africa. You have it in the borderlands between the United States and Mexico with the narco gangs. You have it in parts of South America. Wherever the state is unable to um, make its will felt, you have the possibility of warlords. And I think it's important that we see that what we have is two state failures. And again, the reason for the state failure is twofold. One, for almost 50 years now, we've had a neoliberal discourse talking about the minimal state globally. Without any reflection of what a neoliberal state means, a minimal state means, in societies where civil society institutions, where other institutions are not that deeply or that entrenched, that, or the states themselves are weak. The minimal state often means the abandonment of public functions, public responsibilities. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you that the state that emerges in the Middle East reflected broader uh, dimensions of the Cold War. That we had states whose international boundaries were guaranteed by the Cold War, and only they had to concern themselves with internal um, dissent, internal problems. Therefore, they built very strong secret service, intelligence services, etc., to police the population who they did not really need to depend upon because they externally they didn't need the people. So you had kind of states, almost rentier states, states that didn't need people because for most parts the external security was guaranteed by the superpowers. With the collapse of the Cold War, you have had it is not simply random that you have so many interventions, direct military interventions in the region, because these states, for the most part, have not been able to generate resources from their own people because they've never been able to trust them. And as their internal systems have weakened, the main threat to the state order now has been an external threat. But I want to put all of this into the context of a broader problem of order. We could talk about the various kinds of orders that have been implemented in the region. And we all know the Anglo-French of the 20s and the 30s to the American regional pillars, which were uh, completed by the uh, undone by the Iranian Revolution. Then we have the Carter Doctrine, which basically said the Middle East was an area of supreme national importance to the United States. And then, of course, with the Bush Doctrine, and then we have recolonization and intervention, systematic intervention. 
all of these habitats have been responses to the failure of previous orders to maintain order. Therefore, we've had a situation of more and more entanglement. So what is this order trying to produce? The idea of order, then, is about having an environment which is predictable, controllable, gives you a degree of certainty. That is the key to this kind of order. You want something that is predictable and controllable. However, the order I want to talk about, there is also an epistemological element to it. It's not simply a geopolitical order in which you have relations of states and protocols and institutions. What I want to talk about is what kind of epistemological order does this geopolitical order involve. And I'd like to suggest to you that there are three main categories that underlie the philosophy behind this quest for order. One of them, I would say to you, is Eurocentrism. And this is a quote from Max Weber, and I think it's a very good illustration of the logic of Eurocentrism. It assumes that only in Western history or in Western developments you have anything which is of universal significance, which is worth uh, preserving. What this implies is that for the rest of the world, you have to have westernization, not only in terms of uh, lifestyles, not only in terms of obvious values, but in the way people understand the world. And I think this is an important point, and I will come to that as well. What this consequence means for this region is that we are always in the present. And what I mean is this. Uh, often, when you hear people describe the conflicts, they translate these conflicts from the present back into the past. So you would hear statements saying, the Turks and Kurds have always been at war with each other for thousands of years. Iranians and Arabs have always been at war with each other for thousands of years. Turks and Iranians have always been at war with each other for thousands of years. Shias and Sunnis have always been at war with each other, okay, for hundreds of years. No, they will say thousands because they don't often know how long things are. And the problem with all of this is if you say this repeatedly, you end up repeating it yourself. And you lose out the historical roots the, of all of these events, because we assume what a Kurd is now, what a Turk is now, what an Arab is now, could be taken back into time, and we will be the same. We forget about the mutability of these uh, objects uh, of our analysis. And we end up saying things like this. Well, we know that these people have always been at war. Now, Turkey and Iran, or many of the borders are, have been far more stable than European borders. In the last hundred years, 70 million Europeans were killed by Europeans. No one sees that the conflict between France and Germany is instinctive and primordial and will always be carrying on. No one says if France or Germany disagree over quotas for um, wine in the European Union, this is to do with intrinsic hatred between Germans and the French. Now, Yassin talked about depoliticization of the region. I would say to you, there is a depoliticization of the entire non-West. Conflicts in non-Western places are always presented about being about nothing. What I mean by that is that these are considered to be conflicts of ethnicity, of sectarianism, not politics. It is that which does two things. If you say these conflicts are intrinsic, you are saying that like scorpions and spiders fight, Shia and Sunni will always fight. Kurds and Turks will always fight. Arabs and Iranians will always fight. Because the conflict isn't about anything, it's already locked into who they are. 
you do not need to be um, very historically literate to realize the absurdity of that position. At the same time, you have to recognize that this is the position that is constantly being pushed, and events are unfolded according to that logic. So let me give you a very brief example that we've seen in our own, in our own, from our own eyes. When the initial uprising against the Syrian regime took place, there were two sides. Those who opposed Assad and the Ba'athist regime, and those who supported it. What you now see the conflict being presented and increasingly as a conflict between Shia and Sunnis. And what that has done, and this is not a neutral thing, we know that there are attempts to make the conflict like that, but it has, in fact, the logic of it is to turn it into a conflict, a sectarian conflict, which has no political motivation, which would never end. Because the real issue then is no longer a governance, a model of government, but really of who people are. And these people are then fixed and they have to fight. There is no solution in a sense. And uh, in a way, I saw this as simply a manifestation of that, or tempted to be a manifestation of that sort of reading. So what I would say to you is this. If we want to talk about a new Middle East, if we want to talk about social change, we have to recognize that the objects, agents, structures, states, all the elements around which we build our analysis are themselves products of historical development. They are not necessary. They reflect decisions and processes that took place, which could, in many cases, have taken other ways. Um, very recently, I was asked um, in a radio program, well, why did the caliphate fall? And they expected an answer to, to something about um, you know, the decadence of Islam and all of this thing. And I said, the reason why the caliphate fell, well, it's because the Ottomans lost the First World War. It was simple as that. Now, you can argue with the reasons for that, but it seems to me there's a tendency to think that we have to deal with necessary developments, when in fact they are contingent developments. And in fact, most statecraft takes place in a very contingent field. People make decisions. They could have made other decisions, and things would have been different. So the first problem that I have with the epistemological challenge we face is the problem of Eurocentricism, and the second one is of the always present. The third one, I will say to you in a very profound way, is the problem of Orientalism. And the trouble is this, there's a sense in which people are tired of listening to Orientalism. And there's a kind of thing, oh, well, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, and, you know, we've seen a number of people who worked against Orientalism and critiqued it. It's clearly, the one that's most prominent is Edward Said, but we had people like Martin Watson before him, and Malik, and many others. The reason why I keep going back to Orientalism, the reason why I keep mentioning it, again and again, because it doesn't go away. It still carries on being perpetuated in all kinds of places. And for me, the main, one of the main challenges that we face, as you were talking about universities being set up in rural areas and how important they are, I think there's another question that universities are important. We still do not have universities which have carried out the decolonization of knowledge in a fully developed way. As a consequence, many times we are forced to reproduce Orientalism without even thinking about it. In the way that we organize our disciplines, even the way that we think about um, the organization of what we teach, as well as the organization of what we research. And I think this is really, really important because one of the things that I would like to draw attention to is um, a distinction that Thomas Kuhn made between normal science and revolutionary science. 
Normal science, he argues, in the history of scientific development, occurs when you have very clear rules about what constitutes knowledge, how to constitute it, and how you can determine it. So you're carrying out experiments. And I will give you an example that most undergraduate work works under the condition of normal science. We know what undergraduates should know. That's why it's very easy among colleagues to mark undergraduate essays. Once you get to postgraduate work, if it's really interesting and creative, it often has to make its own criteria for judgment. And I think it's important that that change, that moving away from normal science to revolutionary science, is the task of inventing rules rather than following them. And one of the main problems that we confront still, and it's not just uh, the Muslim world or the Middle East, but generally, is we are still by and far carrying out Orientalism in which we are applying rules rather than inventing rules for understanding. Now, Orientalism, as you probably know, has, in Edward Side's work, three main components. The one which is the most unremarkable is simply an academic description to describe all the writings and research and scholarship about what's called the Orient. The second one he talks about is a style of thought, which is based on the idea that what is European or Western is very different from what is Oriental or non-Western. And the third one is what he calls corporate enterprise for managing relations with the Orient. Now, all of these go together, and you can see this in the way, for example, foreign policy um, spokesmen from Western countries often speak. Many of them end up um, working in universities. Uh, many of them are products of scholarship, not all of them, which either as a activity of proper research or through cultural assumptions knows what the Orient is. So, for example, many um, politicians would go and say, how fantastic, we have a coalition of regional powers fighting against ISIL. And when you look at this coalition, they will say, look, we have Bahrain, and we have Qatar, and we have Saudi Arabia sending in plates. Not realizing that Bahrain is the same Bahrain which suppressed the Arab, its own people for demonstrating for libera uh, liberation and emancipation. Not for imagining for a minute that when people say the Saudis have done this, they're referring to an absolute monarchy. One of the main ways in which Orientalism manifests itself in the world is through the imaginary in which Western countries and Western culture sees itself as democratic and therefore it sees itself as always on the side of the people in non-Western societies. The dirty secret that Muslims and other Africans and other South Americans and other Asians know is that in most occasions, Western governments are on the side of governments, not the people. This is something they, it is very, very difficult to get across. The experience of the peoples of the South has nearly always been in which Western governments have supported West dictatorships rather than people. And 
and then they forget. So, for example, in all the literature and all the discussion which has gone on about ISIL and its causes, no one mentions al Sisi. No one mentions the coup that overthrew the elected government after one year, and which, at the minimum, you would say, the West certainly was quiet about and didn't criticize, though people would go much further than that. They can see no link between that and the kind of descent into violence. Because for them, the image still remains that they're always on the side of the people. Now, this poses a number of challenges to the organization of order in the region. The reason why there is disorder is because the state systems which have been planted since the end of the First World War lack fundamental legitimacy for most of the time. The only means of gaining legitimacy is through popular engagement. Only your people can give you legitimacy that means anything. In the absence of legitimacy, you have to use coercion. And the more coercion you use, the more delegitimized you become. Because the access Exercise of authority becomes the exercise of tyranny when no one accepts the right to make those authority decisions. To give you a very banal example, most children, most of the time, will listen to their parents. Most students will listen to their teachers as long as they think the teachers are acting in a legitimate way. The problem isn't with hierarchy. The problem is when that hierarchy becomes illegitimate, and this is where politicization comes into it. That when it's seen no longer as a hierarchy, but as a relation of violence, something which is arbitrary, that is where the problem arises. Given this epistemological challenges. It would be a shame that if we simply talked about how we can break order in the region without thinking about the epistemological and philosophical questions which make that order possible. I would put it to you that simply having a reordering based upon more or less legitimate state system, trying to reproduce what happened in Western Europe, or what we think happened in Western Europe, is not going to work, simply because any geopolitical project has an epistemological side to it. And one of the marks of depoliticization is the neglect of that philosophical side, to see the geopolitical as something which is always there something which is necessary, which doesn't have any of its own roots. Now, one of the reasons why uh, I think Orient Edward Said's book, Orientalism, remains so important is because in the first two pages, it introduces, first seven pages, it introduces two categories, which I think are really, really um, significant for any kind of future analysis. One is the category of hegemony, which he takes from Gramsci. And the other is the category of discourse, which he takes from Foucault. And Said is one of the first people to put hegemony and discourse together and produce a analytics which takes the idea of representation of language not simply as descriptive, but as something which constitutes realities that we live in. 
And what he's doing by putting hegemony and discourse together is eroding the difference between epistemology and ontology, between theory and practice. But really what, he, what that means is trying to explain how is it that we live in the world as we do. In other words, he's trying to argue that the descriptions that we work with are actually not simply uh, minor detail. I would say to you that what we're dealing with is a deeper uh, analysis in which is really looking at the way that reality is constructed for us. Rather than taking reality as something which is already there and we just work around it, it is actually taking into account how language itself is constituted of what we understand. We have been talking about the Middle East. Now, this term itself is inherently problematic. But it's no more problematic than the term African or the term Asian or the term um, American. All of these terms reflect their beginnings at a particular point and their and have certain kinds of commitments. The Middle East is in the middle of what? And the middle from which point of view? Uh, people talk about Asia. Well, before Europe, there was no Asia. We've had literary traditions in the Euphrates around the Euphrates Tigris, around the indigenous Ganges, around the Yellow River and the Han River in China. But there was no sense that this was one thing, one Asia. As a consequence, the quest for looking for commonalities based on the contrast with Europe makes it difficult for us to understand the kind of historical specificity of the regions and the kind of configuration around them. So while we talk of the Middle East, it is not a name that arises from the history of itself. If that can be told. And you can say, well, it doesn't matter. And in some ways it doesn't, but in, in other ways it does, because one of the problems is that uh, behind this regional designation, this kind of neutral designation, is the inability to tell a story about the region as a coherent narrative. The Middle East is a designation given by others outside the region. It's not, therefore, it cannot be told, the story of the region cannot be told from the region itself. It would mean different kinds of compromises. Now, I think here it's really important to understand discourse as a form of what Wittgenstein called language games, which is not just words, but also deeds, that they go together to make sense. We have a sense, we believe, that the meaning of something can be located in its name. If we find the correct name, the correct definition, we will understand it. So we look for the correct name for things. And a lot of uh, Middle Eastern studies is looking for names, correct names. The difficulty with that is, as I've tried to indicate, that the names that are presented are actually given. So for example, the Middle East, or Shia, or Sunni. These are names that are already given, and then you try to find what can fit into them. Wittgenstein argued that it's not so much the names of objects which gives meaning, it's how they're actually used in a particular context. So if those of you who play chess, if I told you, here is the king, it will not tell you anything about how it moves. It will not tell you how you play with it. It simply will tell you it is the king. Similarly, when we say this is a Sunni, this is a Shia, it doesn't actually tell us how it works, how it, what it actually means in a particular context. How we understand it 
is because within the main Shia or Sunni or any of the kind of ethnic designations, we already have a notion of the apolitical nature of non-Western societies. At the core is this the ethnicization of political conflict, because political is about conflict. The political arises, as Carl Schmitt is very famously said, whenever you have a distinction between friends and enemies. If that distinction between friends and enemies is hardwired into your being, it's no longer political. Spiders and scorpions are not political. Ant colonies are not political. They cannot help. They don't have friends or enemies. And if we continue to treat the Middle East in terms of this ethnicization of conflicts, we will reproduce the instability forever. We will reproduce the absence of order because order can only come through a political settlement. So land exchange, it seems to me, are a very important way of thinking about how we understand the region, how we understand the, the quest for order. Because what language games draw attention to is not, the meaning is not located in the names of objects and concepts, but how they are deployed, how they are made sense of. And our job as analysts of various kinds is then becomes not to find the right name, but to find the context of usage. And there, it seems to me, is a slightly different research agenda rather than trying to find the essence of what something is. The quest for essences has to be abandoned because it will never lead to anything except the perpetuation of domination over the region. This is a, one of my favorite quotes from Lin Kaldun. The reason why I mention this is because I like to think of this quote as the beginning of post-colonial thought. At least the hint of what post-colonial thought is for Muslims. I think what Ibn Khaldun identifies here is the effect of defeat on culture, on a sense of being. And I would say to you that what I have been talking about is really a kind of a reflection on how the region has to come to terms with a sense of being subordinated, a sense of defeat. And one of the answers that it many came to was that the reason why this happened was because of the inferior qualities of the region. And you still see people talking about the mentality of Arabs or the mentality of Turks or the mentality of Kurds or the mentality of whoever as a way of explaining whatever they need to explain, whatever crisis, whatever problem exists. Look at the mentality of these people. I would suggest to you that the question of mentality should be avoided, if not abandoned. Because it leads us back to a kind of thinking in which 
we are looking at essences to explain things. <laughs> the reasons for corruption, the reasons for despotism, are not located in mentalities as such. They are products of particular configurations, particular decisions, particular moves, particular relationships which are established. And therefore, they can also be undone. But they will not be undone if we continue to think in terms that the region, the Middle East, exists. It has one essence, and that essence is traumatic and chaotic, and it requires one form of discipline to turn that chaos into order. And this is what we are constantly being confronted with. I want to sort of start concluding what I want to say by suggesting to you that if we are serious about looking at the new Middle East, we need a new vocabulary. A new Middle East will not come by using the same conceptual language as before. And in this regard, I would say to you that we have to move away from looking at the objects of study as already pre-given. Instead of treating people, ethnicities, social formations as already determining our analysis, we need to think about what forces, what decisions, what processes made those possible. In a sense, what I'm saying to you is that we need to recognize behind the notion of national, regional identities and state structures around them, processes which put them together, which assemble them into collectives and which put them in the possibility as a building blocks of political projects. And this does not mean that they're illegitimate or improper. They're no more illegitimate than being British or being French or being American. But let us recognize that they are not written forever in the past, that they are processes that can be worked upon. I'd like to conclude with making three kind of epistemological pleas. I think it's very important that we refuse to accept that world history is simply going to be a larger version of Western history. that the various development stages, the various rationales, the idea that Western history has salience for others has to be examined and not accepted. And to illustrate this point, I will give you just one example. Take the category of religion. We as Muslims are often called upon to say something like this, that Islam is a religion, and religions we act like this, and then we have to explain why Islam is deep. For example, why is there um, no secularism in Islam, or is there secularism in Islam? This is a question that arises because we take the category of religion and forget that the category of religion reflects an enlightenment reading of Western Christianity and all other faiths, traditions, are put into that. 
and they do not necessarily make sense. To talk about Hinduism as a religion, or Judaism as a religion, or even um, Islam as a religion, requires a great deal of violence. And perhaps it's not a useful concept for us. We then have to answer questions which have nothing to do with Islam and more to do with the question of religion. So one of the things I would say to you when I say that we have to uh, abandon the idea that Western history is world history, it means we have to think very carefully of what are the terms within Western history which have any resonance anywhere else. They may do and they may not do, but I think this is a question we need to at least start off with the assumption that it's not the same. I think linked to that is a provincialization. And nowadays we've moved into a state that everyone is willing to say, um, yes, we don't accept Eurocentricism. We hate Eurocentricism. We're against Eurocentricism. And then let's now, we've said that, we will do Eurocentricism. In a sense, we have claims that we reject it, but those claims are constantly belied by our practice. And I think we have to accept the provincialization of Western claims to the universal have to be profoundly thought, not simply stated in conferences about Orientalism, but actually what do they mean? And do we have the self-confidence to actually state that repeatedly, clearly, um, with great conviction? The third kind of epistemological commitment that I think we would require is a comparative, a greater comparative dimension, and I know there's a lot of interesting work that's already begun, which sees the region and the Islamic networks in comparison with other groupings in the South. I think the movement or the project for the epistemology of the South has many interesting insights which could illuminate our understanding of the region. And I think it's important that we understand the histories of the South much better than we do. We tend to focus on the histories of the West, like they may have some answers for us, but actually the histories of the South are much more pertinent. So again, I think this is an interesting development. I would like to see more of that going forward. I said to you that the talk was really about ever-decreasing circles. And the main metaphor that I started off with, the ever-decreasing circles, was a recognition of a failed hundred years of trying to bring order, a legitimate order to the region. In particular, we've had Western um, interventions of increasing intensity and increasing violence to try and bring order. I talked about the post-Ottoman as a way of alerting not to the idea that the Ottoman um, order was unproblematic, but the kind of order that existed was at certain moments at least distinct and independent, and it proposed a different kind of logic. And it had different kinds of solutions, some worked, some did not, but it was there. Now, what we've had in the last hundred years of Western intervention is both the consolidation of Orientalism as a discipline and its use. But I would say to in working out how to govern the region. The latest episode of this, of course, as you are well aware, is the use of American anthropologists to help the American military carry out a successful occupation of Afghanistan to work out which are the tribes and different groups. 
and there are many studies which have been done um, around uh, again in support of the military, American military, to work out the Arab mentality, etc. And now with the war on terror, you have experts working out who is an extremist. Uh, you know, and you have people giving lectures to the American, the FBI, saying you can work out whether an extremist by the length of their beard or if they have a beard or not. Um, almost something, and this is not. A trivial point is actually seriously put down that having a beard will make you an extremist, but not having a beard doesn't. I don't know if that applies only to men, but. Um, so I think it's important that we recognize the failure is not simply a failure to bring good governance or prosperity or free peace. The failure is an intellectual, epistemological, philosophical failure because those two things are completely locked into it. The attempt to read the Middle East through Oriental lenses and then to fashion it, to hammer it into that Oriental shape will, has failed and will carry on failing. And the upsurge of violence is a marker of that failure, not its success. So I think as scholars, and researchers, we have a responsibility not to repeat the failure. I think it was um, someone once said that the sign of madness was doing the same thing and expect again and again and expecting a different result again and again. In which case, if we carry on trying to understand the Middle East in these terms, we will continually fail. And that failure suggests that there is something not working in our minds. There is a madness here. So, my proposal is that we reject foundationalism, reject the call of essences, to focus upon how things come into being rather than treating them as already there. Recognize the primacy of the political, that ultimately this is not about social construction. This is about political struggles which create and congeal forces into institutions which then turn into object, subjects and agents. Structures are made through the political. Secondly, I'd like to suggest that we need to overcome Orientalism, not just empirically by trying to get more um, data and getting better facts and better data. Facts and data will not free us. They will simply add to what already exists. What we need is a process of rethinking the terms of the Oriental enterprise. And finally, I would suggest that we need an engagement with uh, decolonial thinking, with many of it um, began in Latin America, but in parts of Africa and in Asia. And this is not to quest for its authenticity, but really to try and move away from Eurocentricism in a profoundly uh, radical way. The name I call this, that these kind of three developments, is really critical Muslim studies. And for me, in a way, the emergence of a discipline called critical Muslim studies is a response um, to some of the criticisms that I've made, but also the offer of trying to understand the world in a better way. And it seems to me that something like the Project of Critical Muslim Studies allows us to focus on the epistemological questions. It allows us to recontextualize the construction of nations and states. And it allows us to restitch the pre colonial and the post colonial. It allows us to see that ultimately what we should be thinking about is not the essence of the Middle East, the essence of um, any particular.
particular kind of entity, but recognizing that a post-Orientalist, a post-positivist approach to understanding is perhaps the best hope for us coming to a world, coming to accept the changes and transformations that are going through the region without trying to box them in to previous categories, which have been partly responsible for the failure of peace and order. So for me, the quest for a post-Ottoman order is both a geopolitical and epistemological project. And the primary recognition of that quest is that order is ultimately comes through the primacy of political identity.